Every year, the National Urban League releases its highly anticipated report on the state of black America. The report has become the national touchstone for the social and economic status of African American and Hispanic communities. This year's report, One Nation Underemployed, Jobs Rebuild America, addresses the growing un- and underemployment crisis and how African Americans and other communities of color can recover from the losses of the Great Recession and forge a path to economic stability and upward mobility. Each year, we ask the same question, what is the state of black America? Today, our esteemed guest will answer that question as it relates to the war on poverty. Launched 50 years ago by President Johnson, how far have we really come? What issues are we facing and what can be done? Joining me, Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League. Welcome, Mark. Jeff, good to be with you. This is one of those things that that every year you do the work, but there's always nuances. And, And as you're looking at 50 years since this war on poverty. What does that even mean to you? How do we contextualize We're at this tipping point, this juncture in American history because we look back to 50 years ago when LBJ, that great Texan and that great American president, launched the war on poverty in 1964, Mm -hmm. the year of his reelection. And in doing so, he not only used words, but he used deeds and actions. Out of the war on poverty came Job Corps. Out of the war on poverty came Head Start. Out of the war on poverty came a concerted effort by our federal government to really move the needle when it comes to poverty. So in that 50-year horizon, poverty has come down. On an overall basis, it's been cut probably in half. For African Americans, it's been cut probably almost in half. There's no doubt that LBJ and the beginning of the war on poverty has made the nation greater. But we are at a tipping point because of the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. Because if the war on poverty and subsequent actions moved us forward, the Great Recession moved the nation backwards. It pushed people. And the Great Recession also highlighted some some serious problems that we've had in in clear areas, whether it was education and training, whether it was access to certain industries, what are some of the nuances that I think that that history has taught us and is really driving some of the work you know, that, you, that you, you all are doing? You make a really good point, Jeff, that uh, the Great Recession sort of revealed some things. In effect, it took the mask off. It took the mask off of the fact that uh, educational disparities are significant and that many public schools are failing mm-hmm. our kids and our kids are not achieving as they should. Uh, it's taken, uh, if you will, the mask off of the fact that the divide in income Uh, in this country has been rising for a 30-year period between the wealthiest Americans and the poorest Americans, and to a great extent, between wealthy Americans and middle-class Americans. Mm -hmm. And the Great Recession took the wraps off of that because people finally focused on what has been happening in the United States for the last uh, 30 years. And so that's why this discussion with this year's State of Black America focusing on unemployment and underemployment is so important and so timely. We are at the beginning of an era where a discussion about underemployment, unemployment, and the income divide is going to dominate our political discourse and our community discourse as it should. Well, and, and so what happens next? Be, because if, if we're, if we're going to be honest, I mean, you and I both were part of the Congressional Black Caucus jobless tour, um, and that was almost two years ago now. We've seen constant rates of unemployment and underemployment, especially in certain urban centers, which, which this study is showing, that have been perpetual. But, but obviously there's something we can begin to do. And, and what is the I Urban am, League and what are others looking to I do to make it? I am deeply concerned. And I tell you why I'm deeply concerned. Because uh, what I don't know is if the will, the will from the nation's political leadership across the board is there to move the needle. For example, a simple thing like raising the minimum wage, Mm -hmm. which would lift a large number of people on their own, by their own earnings, out of poverty, is stymied and filibustered in the Congress of the United States. Mm -hmm. Number two, an extension of unemployment benefits, which is really a compassionate sort of measure to try to cushion the impact of long-term unemployment, is again filibustered and thwarted. So these measures, which are relatively small, Jeff, uh, pale in comparison to the kinds of things we need, whether it's investing in 
job training at greater levels so that people can get the skills, whether it's really a concerted effort, I think, to uh, invest in the equity issues around public schools. The question is whether the will is there. But, but let me ask you this, because because I, like you, I, I don't think we need to let Congress off the hook for anything that they failed to do. But, but we also know when we look at issue of the minimum wage, that there are states whose minimum wage levels are far outweighing that of the federal minimum wage. Are, are, are we saying sometimes that we're waiting on somebody to do something that won't happen and we need to fight differently? Um, is it an either or or both end proposition? How do we begin to deal with some of these legislative battles in ways that we're not waiting on a Congress that's do nothing when we've got some state legislatures we can win in? And I think that's, you, you put your finger on a really important point and that is that people are not waiting for Congress when it's come to the minimum wage. I think some 15 to 18 states have raised the minimum wage on their own. Now that state by state minimum wage increases is not the best public policy approach. It's better to have a national standard. But the reality is people are not waiting. Right. They're not going to stand on the side while Congress fiddles and faddles and do nothing. So to some extent, uh, it may mean that uh, our efforts at the state and local level need to be more energized, that mayors and governors and state legislatures and grassroots leaders and community leaders at the local level need to look to uh, their state capitals, their city halls, their county governments, and the local community to do things on their own. But there's no, th no, 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 no substitute, I think, for uh, our national government playing a very important leadership role and taking the steps necessary to try to address this problem. This is a national problem. The unemployment rate is high in almost every state. When I say high, it's higher than it should be. Right. It's higher than it was pre-recession. It is not the kind of economy we want. We've got to build that kind of economy. Well, and, and part of this is industry expansion. And so what can the Urban League, what can those that are watching, how can they engage, whether it's federal, state officials, um, in expanding industry, targeting industry that is going to increase job numbers and create, in, in many cases, you, you know, if, if you give me a second, I, I remember my, my grandfather moved from Columbus, Georgia to Cleveland, Ohio when the Ford plants opened. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the auto industry won't do that anymore. But there are tech industries, there are other industries. Where are some of the industries that you're looking at that are going to turn the, the needle on some of I these numbers? I think we've got to look at advanced manufacturing. There's a, a renaissance taking place in manufacturing in this country. Uh, I think you And is it manufacturing of a certain kind? I think it's manufacturing. Because it's not cars. <laughs> well, you have a much more robust automobile industry in the United States, but a lot of the plants have also moved south. Right. A lot of the plants are now owned by German and Japanese automakers. And to some extent, the uh, big three have come back to some extent. But the automobile industry as an anchoring, driving industry. Will never be what it once was. May be a thing of the past, but it's still critical and important. So I think technology, I think health care and health expansion, I think uh, construction and infrastructure I think are important. Professional services are important. There are a wide range of parts of the economy. We published a plan, an eight-point plan, and also a 12-point plan available at our website, Jeff, that lays out some of the specifics of what I call the Urban League solutions. Mm. But it's so important that people who are out there who are listening in the face of what we're talking about today. I hope one thing they'll take away is the Urban League as a resource. We've got the Urban League Jobs Network online. Where we've got thousands of job listings. We've got 95 local affiliates across the nation. Almost every one of them will help people who walk in find work or we'll try to connect them with a job training program. We want people to understand that as we roll out and talk about the state of black America, the Urban League, the National Urban League, its affiliate network, we're a do tank trying to help people confront uh, the pain, the challenges, and their aspirations with respect to the recession and improving their lives. Where, where are you with partnerships with corporate, corporate corporations and industries? I mean, clearly, pipeline development has to happen so that we're talking about hiring not just low-level, mid-level workers, but also changing executive and boardrooms with people of color to expand opportunity. We, uh, we just created a new national employee, employment, employer advisory council. Mm -hmm. 
That council is made up of uh, a number of companies and it's very specific. It's about helping people who are in our job training programs find employment in particular industries. So we've got new job training programs thanks to a, par thanks to a partnership with the United States Department of Labor now operating in some 20 to 25 cities. Now interestingly, uh, in a number of those cities, that job training is also focused on people who've been involved in the criminal justice system. So we have slots mm -hmm. available to that. Our National Employer Advisory Council, those are people we are engaging to try to open doors to jobs for the people that come through our program. So those partnerships continue to uh, expand, but I would, I would encourage people who really want to see the Urban League's partnerships in action uh, to visit us in Cincinnati this summer mm -hmm. uh, for our annual conference where we're going to have a jobs fair with probably over 100 employers there. So we have a big focus on not only, if you will, being a voice, but also, Jeff, being a vehicle to help people find jobs. Well, well and with that, and, and before you go, you, you talked in the beginning about there not really being this will in Washington to address some of these issues. Part of this is the narrative. I mean, we've talked regularly about the middle class, but we haven't talked about the, a lot about the working class. We talked a lot about people getting to the middle class, but not talked about a lot of the working or looking for work poor. How do we change the narrative in a way where those folks who we're really talking about don't get lost in the semantics. I would like to see the conversation be about middle plus working class plus poor Americans. I mean, I think expanding the narrative, because see, in the recession, you have Americans who've spent their life in the middle class mm -hmm. with a home, with a stable job, who are now, quote unquote, no longer in the middle class. You've got Americans who were in the stable working class who've now fallen uh, to the poor, who are struggling to make it. This uh, economic divide that we're talking about, Jeff, has really seen the top 15 or 20 percent uh, with all of the increases in income, all the increases in wealth. And I'm not, to, I'm not here to bash the 20 percent. Mm -hmm. I'm here to say that we need an economic revival that moves the cars, the, ch the, the, the trains of everybody, that moves all Americans upward and that's a kind of a that's a kind of a economy we have to build and we have to insist on it and we have to hold all of our leaders accountable and uh, and and this year's state of black America is about focusing on that I might add this year's state of black America is also a bit different we're gonna have information mm -hmm. on over 70 plus cities so people will get a chance to see the income divide the black white white Latino income divide in their own hometown and let me tell you that information is interesting. Mark, thanks so much for spending this time and breaking down the state of black America for us. Thank you, Jeff. Everybody, please share this web series with your social media friends and followers, and let's continue this solution session by using the hashtag jobs for all. Now get involved. The state of black America web series has been presented by AT&T. Thank you, AT&T, for your continued support of the National Urban League. We also thank Comcast for their production support of the State of Black America web series. Together, we're empowering communities and changing lives. You can check me out every day with my video segment at theroot.com and hear me on the Ricky Smiley Morning Show every Tuesday and Thursday, or follow me on Twitter at Jeff's Nation. For more information on the State of Black America and to purchase the book, please visit National Urban League at NUL.org.